The question of how stone was sawn in the ancient world, especially hard materials like granite, has attracted attention for over a century. Yet it remains a subject of research and debate, as no definitive explanation of the technologies used has been found to this day. Experiments conducted with simple tools believed to have been available in antiquity have shown low efficiency and a high rate of metal consumption when cutting hard stone. Based on these findings, a widely accepted view emerged that working granite and similar materials in ancient times was extremely labor-intensive and resource-consuming. This idea gained recognition within the scholarly community and, at the same time, sparked skepticism among alternative researchers. A possible benefit of such notions is the increased interest in ancient monuments and the resulting boost in tourism appeal. However, this discussion has overshadowed questions far more significant than stone cutting itself, issues we will certainly address in future episodes. It is important to clarify that I am not trying to defend any particular point of view. My goal is to analyze observable evidence, specifically the tool marks visible on artifacts. I do not adhere rigidly to any single theory and strive to avoid bias, as it limits the perception of information. This approach assumes a willingness to revise conclusions as new data emerges. So, let us examine the question. What kind of tool was used and what were its characteristics? To do this, several steps are necessary. Step 1. Review artifacts bearing the most characteristic saw marks. Part of this work has already been presented in previous videos where we examined the unfinished sarcophagus from the Cairo Museum, tool marks on the sarcophagus inside the Great Pyramid, a granite slab from Abu Rawash, and the lid and fragments of a gray sandstone box from the so-called Headless Pyramid. Step 2. Expand the list with additional examples. An artifact from Abuzir, the Mastaba of Tashepses, a slab of gray sandstone similar to that of the Headless Pyramid sarcophagus with clearly defined working traces, an alabaster sarcophagus of distinctive design from the Pyramid of Sekhemket, saw marks on a granite column in Karnak, traces on blocks in Abusir, as well as certain blocks of the basalt floor on the Giza Plateau. Despite numerous restorations, there are blocks that were brought to museums before these works were carried out, and therefore the traces on them can be taken into consideration, as well as traces of the same type found directly on the plateau. A little later, by using the systematically gathered data, it will be possible to distinguish restoration traces from ancient ones. And not only in Giza, but in other locations as well. These artifacts are not selectively chosen. They represent all accessible examples found on ancient Egyptian monuments. This ensures that the sample is representative for analysis. Step 3. Identify the main properties of the tool marks, and based on this data, reconstruct the characteristics of the tool and its working principle. To achieve this, we will compare ancient traces with those produced by modern power tools as well as by primitive hand tools. Step 4. Conduct experimental reconstructions using tools and materials that would have been available during the period under study. The resulting marks will then be compared with those on ancient artifacts. The outcome may either confirm the method, showing it to be feasible, or reject it, due to discrepancies that cannot be resolved within the technological limits of the time. In the latter case, the range of possible methods must be expanded. This cycle is repeated until the closest possible match is achieved. Step 5. Broaden the analysis by applying the database to other regions where similar tool marks have been identified. This will help reveal common features and differences, and determine whether the Egyptian method can explain analogous traces found elsewhere. Step 6. Analyze possible pathways for the transmission of technology between distant regions and cultures, despite significant geographic and chronological gaps. It should be noted that the described methodology applies only to the analysis of saw marks. Similar steps must be carried out for other stoneworking techniques, from drilling to block shaping and masonry construction. In parallel, it is important to study the structural principles of buildings constructed with precisely fitted blocks, focusing not on external appearance, but on engineering solutions. Such a systematic approach will help us better understand the objectives pursued by ancient builders. To date, no comprehensive work in these directions has been undertaken. Experiments with stone cutting have been conducted, but without systematic comparison to actual tool marks. This is primarily due to the absence of a unified database of ancient saw-cut characteristics. 
As a result, comparisons are often selective or entirely lacking, both in academic and alternative research circles. Clearly, this is an extremely broad topic. Therefore, within the scope of this series, we will examine only saw marks found on Egyptian monuments. Other types of traces, such as quarry marks from Eswan, drilling marks, and comparative analysis with data from Peru, Bolivia, and Turkey, will be addressed in separate studies. In this video, we will begin with the initial steps of the analysis and examine in detail the third point, the characteristics of the tool marks. Let's begin. First, it is essential to distinguish between saw marks and grinding marks. Sawing results in the separation of the stone mass, whereas grinding removes only the surface layer. Despite this difference, in some cases the traces can appear similar, which may indicate similarities in the tools themselves or in the underlying working principles. For example, the slab from Abu Rawash displays marks resembling sawing, although they likely resulted from grinding. For this reason, that artifact is included in the review with some caution. It is also necessary to consider that different tools and techniques may have been employed at different times. However, when analyzing saw marks in a systematic manner, certain recurring features emerge, regardless of stone type or artifact location. The main characteristics are pronounced striations sometimes overlapping with relatively significant depth, a curvilinear cut profile, often irregular rather than forming a neat arc, a kerf width of several millimeters in cross-section, changes in cutting direction and fluctuations in kerf width within the same object, a wedge-shaped cut with a narrowing width toward the base. Each of these characteristics reflects certain properties of the tool or method, though interpretation is not always straightforward. Now we can compare these observed features with the traces left by different types of tools and attempt to identify the most plausible option. While comparing ancient marks with those produced by modern industrial and manual tools may seem unusual, this step is essential, because it is the foundation of a systematic approach. First, however, we can compare the listed characteristics of the cuts with the traces found on the basalt floor blocks of the Giza Plateau. Many of these cuts have different parameters. Their width is nearly constant, without narrowing, and is significantly greater than just a few millimeters. There is visible randomness in the creation of the cuts, with overlaps or slight misalignments. This indicates that cutting the stone posed no particular difficulty. If the cut was made in the wrong place, it was simply redone, without much concern for getting it right the first time. Some cuts may have appeared as a side effect of moving the saw to the next block, due to the high speed of the process. The shape of these cuts is convex, which is not typical of ancient traces. All of this points to restoration work carried out using wire sawing. Additionally, there is uniformity in the cut, without the deviations typical in ancient workmanship. At the same time, certain blocks display other traces that may be the result of ancient work. Extensive restoration was carried out not only on the Giza Plateau. Similar works are typical for virtually all ancient Egyptian architectural monuments, including Abusir. During the works, the area was cleared and some structural elements were restored. On one of the walls, there is a well-known saw mark. This is perhaps the only trace with such a pronounced curvature. Upon closer examination, the chip on this block is fresh. There are no signs of erosion such as flaking and no color change or so-called patina. This indicates that the trace is the result of modern activity. The fact that the working mark does not extend onto the block to the right may indicate that the blocks were worked in a different position, for example horizontally, and only later installed here. The purpose of such work is obvious. The blocks to the right are of the same height, while all those above are generally rougher at the top. Sawing was carried out to level the course of masonry, even on heavily eroded surfaces. The concave shape of the cut can be explained by wire sawing, in which the cut was made in two stages, first downward, then sideways. After the upper part was removed, an arched trace remained. Another block with tool marks also differs from the other cuts in that its surface is on a single, continuous level. On all other objects, the surface level and the cut direction vary. The lack of surface erosion, along with the unique shape and characteristics of the cuts, indicates that their origin does not match the rest of the artifacts. Therefore, they cannot be included in the analysis on equal terms with the other data. It should also be noted that, despite the large number of blocks presumably made of basalt, saw marks are found only on a few. 
If sawing had been used during the assembly of the floor or cladding, there would be many more traces. This is another argument in favor of the recent origin of these cuts. There are also cuts of another type, shallow ones, similar to those found on pyramid casings. It is quite possible that their origin is due to similar causes. As for the gray sandstone slab from the mastaba of Tashepses with traces of working, there is no mention of this find in the archaeological reports. The mark on its side is not typical of other artifacts, therefore, this block can also be excluded from consideration, since it cannot be identified as the result of ancient stoneworking. And since this is one of the key artifacts where a change in the direction of the cuts is observed, with additional examples being the Giza floor blocks also excluded from consideration, the only remaining example of this type is the sarcophagus of Sekemket. Consequently, the change in the direction of the cuts is a particular feature and is not common to all other objects. At the same time, excluding certain tool marks from Abuzir from the analysis does not mean forgetting about them. On the contrary, they require additional attention and may even warrant a separate publication. Furthermore, in some cases, I will continue to illustrate ideas with their help. The point is that at present, they cannot be used as reference evidence for any claims. Being different from the rest of the marks, they represent a separate class. Now we can proceed to comparing the ancient cuts with common types of stone working techniques. Let us begin with the method of diamond wire cutting. In this technique, the cut typically has a convex profile, never a concave one. However, on the artifacts under study, the cuts are either straight or concave, which does not correspond to this principle. Furthermore, the thickness of a diamond wire is significantly greater than the width observed in the ancient kerfs. In the case of abrasive cutting using a simple rope, the kerf is also much wider than what we see on the ancient examples, and the profile of the cut remains convex. Therefore, any form of wire cutting does not match the observed features. The next option is circular saws. This method can also be ruled out because the cuts in ancient examples change direction and, in some cases take on irregular forms. Additionally, the striations produced by a circular saw look very different. When performing an incomplete cut with a disc, the tool must move along the workpiece, creating radially concentric striations with an offset, a pattern not seen on the artifacts examined. All curvilinear cuts observed in ancient material indicate a method based on reciprocating motion along an arc. Moreover, the radius and direction of the arc vary suggesting that the movement was adapted to each specific task and was not constrained by a fixed mechanical setup. Now let us consider cutting with a diamond chain. This technique also does not fit. The striation patterns left by chain cutting are different, especially in areas where a through cut is impossible. In such cases, traces resembling successive overlapping arcs, similar to those produced by a circular saw, would be expected. These are completely absent on the examined artifacts. Furthermore, the minimum kerf width produced by a chainsaw is far greater than just a few millimeters. Therefore, chain-based tools can also be excluded. Water jet or laser cutting methods can likewise be dismissed. Neither a jet of water nor a laser beam can produce curved cuts with changing directions. None of the methods considered result in a wedge-shaped cut, except for the use of a rope with abrasive, but this option does not match the observed characteristics. Taken together, the evidence, the shape, width, and character of the striations points to a tool with a flat or slightly rounded blade relatively thin at its working edge. This hypothesis aligns with the observed traces, including the well-known example on the granite column at Karnak. It is important to note that saw marks are relatively rare. For example, they are virtually absent on the blocks of the pyramids, even though such a method would have been convenient for working limestone. The traces on the granite facing of Menkaurus pyramid resemble surface grinding rather than cutting. Kerfs on limestone appear only on casing blocks, likely as a result of adjustment cuts made in parallel, but it is more accurate to describe this as parallel grinding rather than true sawing. Most saw marks are found on sarcophagi, but these are isolated objects rather than evidence of large-scale production. Therefore, there are no indications of an industrialized technology. If such a method had been available, it would have been widely applied. Overall, the number of such traces is extremely small, hardly enough to gather even a few dozen examples. Another important point 
If an industrial saw had been used, saw marks would appear on all sides of a sarcophagus, including the interior surfaces. Even partial use of a circular saw would have greatly simplified the task, not to mention a chainsaw, specifically designed for such work. Yet no sarcophagus shows any cutting marks on its inner surfaces. Only drill traces are present, which is far from an efficient method. The same principle applies to stone removal in general, where drilling techniques were also employed on a smaller scale. Let us consider the nature of the tool's movement. On some artifacts, changes in the angle of the cut line are noticeable, and over small sections. This indicates a change in the direction of the saw's movement during the work process. However, as has already been noted, such marks are observed only on the alabaster sarcophagus of Sekemket, and not only on its exterior, but also on the inside. Given the softness of this material, it is evident that in this case we should be speaking of grinding, since sawing within such a narrow space is technically impossible. Moreover, as mentioned above, the inner part of the chest was created by drilling, not by cutting. Another significant observation concerns variations in kerf width. Changes in cutting angle should not affect kerf thickness, as the blade remains the same size. Moreover, in some cases the cutting direction remains constant while the width still changes. This suggests that the variation is not caused by angle, but by tool condition. Two common explanations, progressive wear or poor alignment, would typically produce gradual changes. Instead, the observed variations are abrupt, indicating sudden changes in blade dimensions. With wire sawing, a cut can deviate slightly, creating a wavy profile. However, this method does not match the observed curve shapes, and a flat blade would not produce such distortions. One might assume that the blade was very narrow, similar to a coping saw or band saw, allowing it to flex and shift. However, such a tool could not produce deep, curved cuts. Another hypothesis is the use of different tools for straight and curved curves. Yet both types frequently occur on the same artifact, suggesting the use of a single tool with changes in its movement pattern. Therefore, the most plausible explanation is that kerf width changes resulted from alterations in the blade's thickness during the process. The primary conclusion, cutting was performed manually, possibly with the aid of simple guiding devices. The process was not mechanized and lacked stability or precision. Frequent directional changes inevitably affected both dimensional accuracy and surface quality. A further conclusion is that the tool's performance was inconsistent, with sudden shifts in cutting direction or blade thickness. This points to rapid wear and the use of a relatively soft metal, most likely bronze. The narrowing of the blade can possibly be explained by the saw being periodically subjected to cold hammering for hardening, which did improve the properties of bronze, but at the same time reduce the thickness of the working edge. However, periodic hammering during the work process would likely affect only the lower part of the saw without altering the width of the entire blade. Therefore, the use of bronze tools and manual labor imposes significant limitations, which is confirmed by experimental data. We will discuss the resulting discrepancies and possible explanations in the next video. Thanks for watching. In the next episode, we will continue the analysis. See you next time.